Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, coming along to today to our session on Indigenous science and uh, Indigenous and, and citizen science. Welcome to SITSI um, Oz 2021. My name is Stephanie Von Gavel. Um, I'm the Vice Chair of AXA and also a Business Development um, Manager with CSIRO. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and the lands that we're all meeting on today from across Australia. Here in Canberra, where I'm based, it's the Ngunnawal and the, and the Ngambri people, and I, I'd like to pay my respects to the Elders past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge and respect um, any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are on our um, discussion today. Um, our session today is, is sponsored by the Atlas of it, oh, the entire actually conference has been also uh, sponsored by the Atlas of Being Australia and again I'd like to thank so, them so much for their, their support as well. It's actually my delight to introduce you to um, Marley Hutton. Um, Marley's a, 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 a Bardi Yaw, Yaw, a woman from the Kimberley and having grown up in, in Broome and Marley's a research officer with CSIRO and is, is working on a number of projects in the marine and coastal environmental area and she's going to be talking to us today about the project that she's working on and leading um, um, eye on water in Australia in the Kimberley region. Thanks very much Marley. Hi everyone, um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'd first like to start my presentation by acknowledging the tradition, traditional custodians of the land that I'm on, the Yaru and Jugan people, and extend that acknowledgement to the lands of, uh, that everyone is uh, joining in from. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about the Iron Water Project specifically in the Kimberley, uh, but first a little bit about my background. So as Steph said, I am a Bardi Jawi woman. Uh, I uh, grew up in Broome, in the Kimberley uh, and I'm now very lucky to have brought my work with CSIRO back home. Um, I've been working with CSIRO for five years, um, particularly in, involved in a lot of um, Kimberley based research or Arnhem Land based research, looking at Indigenous engagement, Indigenous coastal development um, and Indigenous livelihoods. And um, yeah, I'm very excited today to be telling you about the Iron Water um, app. I won't go into too much detail about the app itself because um, Janet Anstey, my colleague, presented a little bit earlier on it, but I'll give you a brief overview. So the app is available to anyone who has access to a phone, um, Android or iPhone. It's free and it's only been introduced to Australia, the Australian version, since I think 2017 or 18. Uh, the app is used to photograph watercolour uh, water and is matched to a colour palette we call the Floral Yule Scale. Uh, this water can indicate, um, oh, sorry, the colours can indicate a lot about the water, um, what's in it uh, and its health can help us monitor its changes as well. So the watercolour is incredibly important to us uh, because we have huge variations of watercolour across Australia and uh, the Floral Yule Scale is what we use to measure those colours. So this is a universally uh, recognised way of measuring uh, watercolour and it then helps validate our satellite imagery. So here's an image, you can see the variations in watercolour across that um, small region there and then that, you know, that can be incredibly diverse across even a small range which I'll later um, discuss, particularly associated in the Kimberley. So after we get this data from uh, citizen scientists using the app, it's then used by our scientists um, to con contribute to calibration of satellite imagery to ensure we get really reliable information and really reliable data from those satellite images. This is important because those satellite images can capture and track variations in our water systems. So this goes for freshwater or saltwater systems. Uh, and those changes can uh, tell us a lot about what's going on in the environment. Uh, they can be a result of seasonal changes, uh, extreme climatic events such as ash flow, cyclones, droughts or flooding. Uh, these water colour changes can tell us about different land uses, extreme developments or mining, uh, and also be linked to eutrophication or um, nutrients flows into the water causing algal blooms. So that's why it's really important that we have a lot of people uh, using the app and collecting data all over Australia, particularly in areas where our scientists uh, can't really reach. So why the Kimberley? Um, as I said before, it's trying to get people who are in remote areas where we can't get to to use the app. Uh, the Kimberley is incredibly remote. 
we have um, you know, lack of uh, access for scientists to get to uh, a lot of locations. Uh, it can be very uh, costly to get there and then very costly to get around once you're in the Kimberley to a number of locations, especially areas of the coastline which are inaccessible uh, with unsealed roads and no facilities. So using um, people who are already based in the Kimberley to collect this data for us is a really valuable asset. The Kimberley is also really important because it's got a highly diverse set of water systems and um, very unique natural influences. So for example, the highly turbid systems we see in the Kimberley, um, there's an example there of Derby Jetty, which is the one on the bottom right with the very milky chocolate sort of looking water uh, where the water clarity is only 0.25 meters. Um, so that's very, very little um, water clarity. It's a really interesting system. And then only um, approximately, I think it's 220 20 kilometers away, you've got this beautiful blue water in Broome. But even though it's incredibly blue uh, and looks, you know, um, looks like it would be clear, when you actually look over it, it has a fairly low water clarity of 0.5 metres. Um, and this changes as well, depending on the tides and other influences. But that's another um, point as well about why the Kimberley is really unique, is we have extreme tidal influences, which can mean that there's massive fluctuations in that water clarity and water colour. Uh, in Derby in particular, I think they have some of the highest tidal influences in the world, uh, with tides reaching up to 10 metres, um, which is really incredible to see as well. So there's some reasons why the Kimberley and why it's so unique, um, work, such a unique place to work and a unique place to collect data. Um, so how we use the app or how we've promoted the app in the Kimberley is really focusing on building that citizen science um, since the app has come out. And we've done that through working with a number of different groups. So we've worked with high schools throughout the Kimberley, as you can see there, ranging from the East Kimberley to the West Kimberley more in the West Kimberley just due to higher population and easier access for um, that promotion uh, and promotion opportunities. But we would really love to expand our partnerships to the East Kimberley a bit more. We currently work with high schools, rangers, uh, also some industry groups that are on there, um, such as Pearl Farms, um, community groups like fishing clubs, uh, and promote our uh, app through signage in and around, um, around waterways. So the, the organisations or groups that I've put up on the screen there are the groups that are more relevant to the talking that where well, all this, this topic that we're going to be talking about today, where it's links to the Indigenous aspects of science and citizen science. So the schools that we work in and um, the range of groups we work with, we decided to start working with those because in the Kimberley, over 50% of the population is Indigenous and many of the locations um, throughout the Kimberley are only accessible to people living there in remote communities um, or people who have access to those really remote areas and know how to get to certain locations where most other people can't. Uh, so that's why we started engaging Indigenous ranger groups um, in particular. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the schools and then we'll move to the Indigenous rangers. But how we work with the schools is through programs which uh, we develop for year four to year 12 students. Um, there's a lot of variation in the programs and a lot of flexibility in how we deliver those programs, but they're usually done through both incursions and excursions with the schools and we provide the teachers with training on how to use scientific equipment so that they can continue those excursions and incursions when um, our CSIRO staff aren't available to be there on the ground. So the incursions, um, these are really fun to run. Uh, mostly because they can be very hands-on uh, and really active ways of learning in the classroom. So we tailor them based on the different uh, year groups as well. So usually with the younger students, we start with uh, this activity where we have different watercolors. We have four water, sorry, three watercolors. We have one with just full of a brown sort of, but very clear water. We use tea bags to do this to represent tannins, which you would usually find in river systems. Uh, we also have a um, bucket full of a muddy or soily type water. We use uh, soil or mud from the local area to mix up into that to, in that bucket to create that idea of suspended sediment in the system. And then the third bucket we use algae um, or represents algae. We just use spirulina tablets you can buy from the shops and mix that in to create the look of what you would find in a really unhealthy system with a 
you know, big algal blooms. So those three samples are, we can, we usually tailor them to suit the students' local environment so that they can recognise uh, certain colours that they would see in their local rivers or their local waterways um, and, and be able to relate. So what creates their water to look like this? The uh, lab equipment that we also provide students with to do in-class activities can um, vary, but usually they include uh, chemical testing kits such as pH testing nitrates, phosphates, or dissolved organic uh, titration activities. Again, these can be tailored to suit the school and um, to suit sort of local area issues or things that are relevant to their systems. An example is an activity we did with the St. Mary's College in Broome. Uh, it was to look at how phosphorus and nitrogen levels, uh, phosphate and nitrate levels increase when there's wastewater uh, introduced to uh, a, a natural system. The reason we looked at this is because a few years ago, Broome had an incident where due to a lot of um, rain, the wastewater treatment plant overflowed, seeped through the sand dunes and then into the local bay. Uh, there was a pretty big algal bloom as a result of that. And then people weren't allowed to go fishing or eat anything um, in the bay for a couple of weeks following. So we chose to look at that uh, because it was relevant to the students and it was relevant to the area and it was a way of helping them to understand better what was going on in their systems. Um, and then also identifying how watercolour can influence these sorts of things that go on um, in, your, in your local area. So another thing we also like to teach these students when we do this activity is that just because you don't have beautiful blue clear water, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your water. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see how many of them are surprised when they hear that, especially the students from areas like Derby where the water's like a chocolate milk colour. They just assume that there's something wrong with their water because it's brown and it's muddy. Um, but an analogy or something I like to tell them, which is makes them sort of realise why um, why we're doing what we do and why it's important to monitor water water colour and any changes is, I say, um, you know, if one day you go down fishing to the jetty at Derby where you you know your water's milky brown but all of a sudden you go there one morning and it's crystal clear and blue do you think something's wrong and all the kids are just like oh wow yeah then there'd be something wrong so it's really about understanding what's right for that area and what's normal for that area and what changes um, or drastic changes could mean and um, I think it gives the students a really good idea about how to or gives them a different lens to look at their local environment with uh, the excursions that we also do are sort of tailored more to schools or students that don't engage engage well in class but prefer hands-on outdoors activities. Uh, we provide the schools with um, equipment such as secchi discs to measure water clarity, pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen to and salinity and conductivity meters and probes. And the staff that work with the students are given the training to be able to work with these kids without our supervision. So they can go out and do this regularly. Our probably most engaged school is Broome Senior High School. Their Bush Rangers group goes out almost, I'd say when they can fortnightly to the Broome Jetty and they get samples. Um, this relates back to the Iron Water app because the students all bring their phone along, take photos, and then there's actually a different tab in the app where they click, I am an expert and then all the different parameters, um, scientific parameters come up where they can add clarity, pH, temperature, et cetera. So um, it is a way that they can then send this data back to our scientists, including the images that they've taken on the day. Um, this uh, activity made us really understand what uh, the big, one of the biggest challenges that we faced in remote areas was the lack of suitable land-based sample sites. So to be able to use the app, or um, most of this equipment, you need to be somewhere where you can be above the water, looking directly down with no obstructions, no rocks, um, and also you have to not be able to see the bottom. So in the entire Kimberley, I think um, there was only maybe five locations that would be suitable for this kind of activity. Um, it's just basically if you have a jetty, it has to be a jetty as well that um, isn't too influenced by tides. So that's another limiting factor is sometimes if the kids go down to do a measurement and they haven't checked the tides, there'll be no water to measure. So these were some of the challenges we um, we identified with the app use in the Kimberley. And our way around this was by engaging 
people who would be going out on boats. So that's where the fishing club came in or Signet Bay Pearl Farm, who we also work with, they came in and they go out on their boats uh, fairly often and we just get them to do some, um, take some images and do some water sampling. But one of the um, sort of best groups to work with for these kind of boat-based, very remote boat-based samplings are Indigenous ranger groups. So the Indigenous ranger groups that we've partnered with at the moment are the Danby Mangari Rangers and the Bardi Jawi Uruni Rangers. Uh, they are doing very regular monitoring of their local or their native title areas. And this means that they're out on boats probably two weeks of each month. And while they're out there doing their local monitoring and sampling, we've um, incorporated parts of the iron water activities uh, for the rangers to while they're on the boats. So we, with this, we're able to get data from these remote areas where most people wouldn't even be able to get to. Um, so the Danby Mangari Rangers in particular, their native title region covers over all about 28,000 square kilometres. Uh, including unique, really unique and important systems like King Sound, Camden Sound, Montgomery Reef, Buccaneer Archipelago and the Horizontal Falls. Uh, they are very, very much boat based um, sort of ranges, so they're able to get to unique areas that are really important to us. The Bardi Jawi Uruni Ranges, uh, so they've got a 1000 kilometres square area um, that they cover, but their most of their land, I think it's probably like 70% of their um, native title is ocean or sea country and islands. So they that encompasses the Sunday Islands and the famous Waterfall Reef. Uh, and they can get us really informa valuable information about the Dampier Peninsula um, waterways. So we found that working with those ranges is um, really valuable for us and something we'd really like to expand further to the West Kimberley and work with some ranger groups up there where they've got, again, some more unique, um, unique really remote systems. So the future of eye on water. Um, so in the Kimberley, we are hoping to learn a lot more about what the traditional um, traditional owners have to offer. Uh, we've found with, well, I found when promoting the app use and doing the training with the rangers, there's so many insights and valuable information that they have about their systems that we would really love to be able to incorporate into the app. Um, so we're sort of at a point where we're thinking about developing ideas on how to include this indigenous local knowledge uh, as a feature in the app. Um, a really good example is a lot of the ranges in One On Point or uh, the Bardi Jawi ranges that we work with, I was talking to them once and about watercolour and they were just spurting out all these things about how they knew what times of the year the water is going to be more turbid than others and um, they knew why as well. So it was to do with after big rains, there would be this huge influx of uh, water coming in in King Sound, washing out the Fitzroy River and those plumes that came out of the Fitzroy River, so those really murky um, brown coloured plumes that we saw in the Derby images, they would sometimes reach all the way up to One Arm Point or the Sunday Islands where the water is usually a very, um, usually a very blue sort of um, vibrant blue colour. So these ranges already uh, knew why these things were happening, what times of the year they happened when, and, and you know what the reason for them happening was. And this traditional ecological knowledge is, is really valuable and we would really love a way that it could be easily incorporated into something like um, something like the Iron Water app so we can um, yeah, make the most of this Indigenous local knowledge and then also make it possible for as a sort of recording, um, a recording platform for traditional, traditional owners as well. But um, yeah, that's where we're hoping to go with the future of Iron Water at the moment. And we're really excited to see how it expands in the Kimberley and increase our range of partnerships throughout the region. Um, that's all from me. So thank you very much. There's my details if you want to email me with any um, any questions. Uh, we are going to have some questions now, but also there's the link uh, to our website for more information about Iron Water. And you can also download the Iron Water Australia app for free on your Android or iPhone. Um, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, um, Marley. That sounds like some fantastic um, work and really some great opportunities that you're sort of looking to into the future. Um, please, everyone online, um, post any uh, questions that you might have for Marley. In the meantime, I've got a, um, 
question, Marley. It sounded like a sort of fantastic working with the children across different levels. What were some of the responses that you had from the children or feedback from the teachers about your incursions and excursions and, and did that change, you know, or inspire in terms of some of that STEM um, understanding? We had Corey Tutt, for instance, give us a session last week and he talked a lot about inspiring um, Indigenous students, for instance, to undertake STEM. Yeah, so um, I think it really gave students an interesting insight into what they are capable of. I find a lot of the students, particularly the ones that I work with on the Bush Ranger program, so they're usually kids who don't engage well in class, um, and they see this idea of being a scientist as working in a lab and you know writing equations and and um, you know being behind a computer, but then they see this real field work based side to it, and I think it really opens their eyes to understanding that they even though they don't have an interest in reading and writing and doing all the um, you know all the really academic stuff they have a lot to offer in regards to their local knowledge and as well as their ability to go outdoors and, and collect samples and really the fact that they enjoy these sorts of things um, so I have seen a lot of students you know after these activities um, say to their teachers or to myself like oh, you know, I want to be a scientist now, I want to be a marine scientist, or I want to do something that's outdoors based, where I can collect samples, or I can go out on a boat and do the things that I, you know, I usually love anyway. Um, so I think it's yeah a bit of an eye opener for students, definitely understanding how diverse this a career in STEM can be, um, and how it can incorporate things that they already enjoy doing. So yeah. Brilliant. And I think that's a, the great thing too about sort of also participating in citizen science. It actually gives people this sort of pathway, you know, to sort of practicing some science type activities before they, you know, go on to a, a necessary career in, in as a scientist as well. So brilliant. Um, I'm just, I actually have another question. Um, you, know, you talked about sort of rangers collecting um, sort of some of the information through the Iron on Water app. Are they also using that information and, you know, are you feeding back the information to them for some of their own purposes that they might be, you know, as rangers in terms of some of their, their monitoring that they're doing? Yep, so all of the details that are collected through the Iron Water app are publicly available, so you can see all the photos taken, um, all of the measurements taken at the um, website there. That's on the that was on my PowerPoint. Um, and the rangers, you know, creating that partnership with us, then we're able to see what kind of information they would like to focus on and what regions they would like to focus on. We can we we have then gotten requests from some ranger groups for satellite images for them to look at, so they can get a better understanding of what's going on in that area. Um, in particular, some agricultural um, impacts that were happening in a region, uh, they wanted to sort of get some satellite imagery based around that area and so they could um, sort of understand how and if anything's changed uh, due to those agricultural um, developments. And um, we're then able to work with them to provide them that information and they can focus their water collection or their data collection with the Iron Water app in those areas where they think is, is most relevant. Yep. Excellent. Um, oh, I've got a question here from Genevieve as well. Um, so does the data collection include recent weather data? For example, the Catherine River obviously goes brown and muddy when it rains. Um, uh, you know, can participants see this kind of information as well? So the, um, there are some factors of weather involved in the, um, in the iron water uh, photos. But the actual app itself is only just the platform to get the in-ground data. But when we correlate our satellite images, images, they are then matched up, or we can look at how they match up with um, with weather data. So parts of the um, app that do ask about weather, so they, it asks about whether it's um, raining or what the cloud cover is. That is mostly just so we can understand how the lighting might be affecting the image that the students are taking, um, or how it might affect the image that appears in the satellite. Uh, when that comes through. So it, there is ways for it to be correlated, but that's not through the app. That's sort of the after process. Um, once that those images and once the data is calibrated to, um, to assist with that satellite imagery. Brilliant. Did you have anything else to add, Janet? Otherwise I'll go on to our discussion session as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Mali answered it pretty well. Um, in terms of the app, but the database is uh, actually following the fair data principles. And so it's it's integratable with any um, bureau data that you want to um, correlate with um, 
certain observations. And so some of the temporal plots that we're producing from the ion water data, we can then overlay and have a look at the relationship to um, rain events or other meteorological information. Brilliant. Thanks very much. What we thought we'd do now as well, um, I'd like to sort of start having a little bit of a discussion. Um, Janet, um, Marley and I had a, a chat before and, and one of the things we uh, came across was uh, a paper actually that I think would be really useful for people to, to have a look at. And we just I'm trying to sort of get my thing to, to move forward. Uh, yeah. It's this fan fantastic paper, uh, recent paper by Maria Tengo and Bo Austin and, and colleagues around creating synergies between citizen science and, and Indigenous and local knowledge. Um, and, a, you know, I think it's a fantastic paper for people to have a look at to really understand, I suppose, some of those differences and similarities um, and ways of working between different knowledge systems, you know, from an Indigenous knowledge system and also the sort of processes that often happen within um, citizen science. I think one of the, it, the paper also goes through a, a number of different examples, um, international examples, including some of the work that um, marley has been involved as well within the, the Kimberley Saltwater um, project as well. But, you know, there's examples from, from Kenya um, where they've been working with um, Maasai, the Maasai to, to look at uh, lion numbers, but also then using the knowledge, the Maasai knowledge systems around tracking as well to, to understand that. Similarly in Peru, um, a number of Indigenous communities there have um, you know issues or they want to understand more around some of the oil spills that have been happening there and they're using citizen science as a mechanism to do that but I, what I really liked about this paper as well was just the, the diagram that you can see here about ways that you can bring together um, diverse knowledge systems whether it's indigenous knowledges local knowledge um, community-based monitoring but then also some sort of Western-based knowledges, whether it's citizen science or social science knowledges, and actually how that can create a sort of more enriched picture around an issue that you're trying to address. And it talks about these different sort of tasks or actions um, around being able to mobilise, um, translate these different knowledges, you know, create a convergence and, and divergence of information, how you synthesise information to, you know, those different knowledge systems together, but also there may be different application areas. So I'd recommend people to have a, a, a look at that. And one of the, there's a really interesting um, table in this, um, in pres uh, in this paper as well, that really starts to help provide some guidance um, around if you're sort of wanting to, to work with Indigenous knowledge systems within an Indigenous science perspective and vice versa uh, as well. And some of those, you know, um, those aspirations and issues are around actually acknowledging, and this has been an issue for a very long time, around acknowledging uh, Indigenous uh, and Indigenous and local knowledge as a valid um, and legitimate source of, of knowledge. Um, and that that knowledge is also part of the sort of management and practices um, of, um, you know, of communities as well. And that I think that, you know, uh, knowledge holders are a really important part of, of any type of work or project um, that, that's happening. And that actually is also reflected, say, for instance, in the citizen science, 10 principles of citizen science. So the paper talks through some of those and, and actually sort of outlines some of the risks that you need to be conscious of if you're, you're wanting to work across different knowledge systems in this particular um, context. I really also like some of the examples that provided and, and, and Marley will talk a little bit more potentially in our discussion around the Kimberley Indigenous Saltwater Science Project and it outlines some of the processes that they went through to, 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 to work through um, incorporating um, and sharing uh, Indigenous knowledges uh, as well. And there's a great diagram here that, that talks through some of that, um, you know, approaches, citizen science approaches that include both you know science-based and knowledge-based uh, approaches to ecosystem management so again i'd recommend that um, this paper to, to you as well and one of the things that um that i've been sort of working on and, and others um, across australia and internationally is to look at 
um, Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And I think this is a, a really important part of, of what we do um, in the Indigenous science and um, Indigenous engagement area and really understand some of the different concepts around what ICIP is and how we might protect that in science projects or any type of project as well. And a lot of the concepts around Indigenous ICIP have been really articulated really well by Terry Janke and you can have a look at her, her website. And she's an Indigenous academic lawyer, has done a lot of um, uh, work in this space. But it really does show the diversity of um, types of ICIP, um, you know, whether it's expressions of information or it's actually that ecological knowledge, uh, knowledge that um, or traditional knowledge that Mali talked about that the ranges, um, the ranges knew. It can be also some of those specimens, you know, a lot of scientists, indigenous, uh, a lot of citizen sciences and, and scientists are collecting genetic resources and specimens in, in many ways that can also form part of, of, of what is um, ICIP. And similarly, that cultural heritage that's associated with um, cultural sites is really important. And I think as you know, we're collecting data and um, Mali, talk, uh, Mali talked about collecting one type of data, um, is really this em an emerging and, and really important area of work around Indigenous data sovereignty, which is really the right of Indigenous peoples and nations to govern the collection, um, ownership, application of their own data. And there's quite a sort of broad definition of what is Indigenous data. And in many ways, may, some people might think it's just um, data that's, uh, you know, traditional knowledge, or cultural um, or cultural ecological knowledge but there's actually quite a broad um, definition or understanding that's emerging around this it can be um, you know information about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people whether it's cultural information uh, cultural statistical information health data but also actually importantly data that's actually collected or about Indigenous um, resort uh, on on or about Indigenous uh, lands for instance or sea country and so there are various different, if you look at one of those, the top diagram there, you'll see that's a, a diagram sort of showing some of the Indigenous protected areas um, across Australia and how, you know, people collecting um, points, whether it's from scientists or citizen science on lands, how that's, um, you know, that could be regarded as uh, Indigenous data. And there's an uh, improve, uh, increasing um, some principles being developed around how do you actually protect or acknowledge or understand um, Indigenous science, um, Indigenous data. And, and uh, Janet talked about the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable and um, reusable. The CARE principles have, re uh, have been recently developed to, to take into account some of those data sovereignty um, issues as well. And they're primarily focused around collective benefit. How is that information benefiting um, Indigenous people? What's the authority, uh, A, is the authority to control, responsibility um, and ethics that you're sort of undertaking and doing work that has a, a ethical and responsible framework. So they're really just some a few points that I wanted to sort of pose as a as a bit of a just a discussion between ourselves, um, but also on on the discussion line um, too. And I was just hoping that um, I know we've all had a, a, a Janet, myself, and and Marley have had a good read of the the paper. And I was wondering, um, Marley, did you have any sort of general reflections around that paper that you'd like to share with everyone? Yeah. Um, yeah, so a great paper. I um, found it really interesting and I think it covered a lot of really important topics. Uh, one of the questions I had from it, though, is um, where do we go from here? So I think, and this will answer a question I saw in the discussion just then as well, I think um, the idea around understanding that different knowledge systems are valuable and all have their own um, benefits. I think that idea is becoming a lot more um, accepted. And I think especially in science, it's becoming recognised that uh, traditional owners have a very, um, very vast intergenerational um, knowledge systems that can be highly valuable for our Western science systems. That's, I don't think that's debated. I think the, the issues we face and something that wasn't um, really addressed in the paper was how do we get there and, and what are the challenges that scientists are facing um, today to be able to do that. And I think that's um, really something that I have come across in the industry as well is everyone's asking, you know, um, I want to, uh, I want to, I want to do some, um, you know, some science where it involves Indigenous traditional knowledge, uh, but how, you know, what's the appropriate way to do it? And the reason that we're um, bumping into these challenges, I think, is because 
it's still a really new concept. So there's not many frameworks in place um, just yet to be able to figure out the steps to achieve this kind of site. And also it's incredibly very, very varying depending on what groups you're working with. So some groups will have frameworks that they want to um, abide by, other groups might not. Some groups will have um, PVCs in place that you can approach, other groups might not. Uh, so it can be a really complex, um, I suppose, a complex pathway to navigate. And um, I think this paper did a really good job of setting up the foundations for starting to look at how we can overcome those challenges so scientists can start engaging with traditional owners a lot better. Brilliant. Did you have any thoughts, um, uh, Janet, in terms of some of your experiences as well as, as, as uh, sort of engaging Indigenous science and citizen science at the same time? Yes, yeah. Well, as, as Marley indicated, you know, our next step with the Eye on Water program is to really start thinking about how we can incorporate Indigenous local knowledge. And so this paper sort of gave um, at least um, a formulation of how we set up that part of the program in terms of the co-creation and, you know, the, the, the feedback uh, system that we have to develop in terms of collecting data, returning data um, to, to Indigenous um, communities. But I, but I think the question that Mali raised is really critical and that we haven't really quite got a handle on is, is how do we make use of this data or how to communities make use of this data and I think in, for, in, in order, order to be successful in the implementation of this new body of work we've got to think about those issues and have those conversations with the communities um, before we actually you know go out and build something <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the things as well is is that importance of uh, setting up partnerships. I know, Marley, you mentioned you, you'd done some work uh, um, with the, the KISP um, the KISS project as well. And, and I think there were some key partnerships that were developed there. And actually going on to the second question in, uh, I've highlighted here, some of those sort of governance arrangements are really important and the agency and the self-determination that Indigenous um, people have in science projects and potentially in citizen science projects as well. Yeah, so um, I, through Whamsey, I was involved with the early stages of KISP, the Kimberley Indigenous Saltwater Science Program, uh, which after Whamsey finished it, then um, they continued this. It was more, it's like a, a steering committee or a group of traditional owners from different clans throughout the Kimberley uh, coming together and making decisions on um, what science they would prioritise in their regions. Um, and then since uh, KISP funding finished, they uh, started up the group again under the name ISWAG, Indigenous Saltwater Advisory Group, and they've been um, continuously running now for three years. Uh, and their way that they're governing the science that goes on in their area is incredibly impressive. Um, it's no matter like in what industry you're in or, or you know, uh, what part or culture or group of people you're a part of, getting people from different groups together to decide on things is really complex and these guys do it so well. So they have their representatives who are traditional owners, elders, rangers, all come to these meetings um, twice a year, I think, and they have representatives from different organisations like CSIRO and AIMS, and they present ideas on what science um, could be achieved in the Kimberley uh, based on the priorities of the traditional owners. So the traditional owners will say, oh, no, we don't care about you know, doing research on X, but we really, really think it's important that we do research on Y. Um, that way it is already incorporating traditional ecological knowledge because they're the ones that are seeing um, the threats or the changes in the environment and saying, no, no, this is really important because we've seen this happening. And that governance of the science is, is incredibly impressive. And I think um, they've set up a really good example for other traditional owner groups to follow. Um, but linking back to what I was saying before as well, is not everywhere has the capacity um, or the leadership to to set up organisations like these, or well, sorry, um, committees like this. So um, the Kimberley um, and ISWAG or KISP is one very unique example, um, but okay. not everywhere has got something. So um, I suppose seamless setup, uh, yeah. which creates complications. So. 
And I think that that, like you said, that governance, I think, is and that decision about this is the science or, you know, that, that we want done is is foundational because otherwise, you know, anybody can come and say, yeah, I want to do this, this and this. And it, it's not directed to, towards the sort of aspirations and needs and priorities um, as well. Are there any other sort of final reflections that um, you both like to, to make on the paper or, or, or more generally on the topic of Indigenous science and citizen science? Um, <laughs> I think yeah. I think uh, that the um, some of the things that we've learned during the conference as well have become a lot more aware of um, uh, interactions and engagement in in citizen science projects, and it's made me aware that citizen science actually provides a framework, a structure for uh, this type of engagement directly into science outcomes. And I think that that's been um, really interesting to see some of the other ones that I wasn't aware of. I came across um, uh, yesterday the um, Aboriginal Waterways Management Assessment Tool, which I hadn't been aware of, of the Murray-Darling Basin, and looking at how that's, inter and look at how that's been implemented in both the community and in the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. So I think that those types of um, uh, programs are really useful um, for us starting off um, with integrating ind Indigenous uh, local knowledge. Brilliant. Any last words, Bali? Otherwise, I'll um, thank you for... Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to say, like, um, I, I've only been involved in the industry for oh, three or four years now, and I've seen in that space like a huge change in the cultural acceptance of traditional ecological knowledge and ways of um, incorporating it into science. Um, so I, as, as it's not a huge thing that's being done at the moment, I uh, honestly expect it to be an incredibly, um, you know, like common common occurrence in the future. And um, yeah, really excited to see when that all happens. Brilliant, thank you so much. And I've just thrown up on to the, the screen as well some um, some resource resources for, for everybody if they're, they're interested to have a look. The the guide from the Kimberley Saltwater Project is is fantastic. There's a sort of recent IATSIS code and, and guidelines as well, and it provides some really fantastic um, outlines, as well as actually the sort of Indigenous, um, the Our Knowledge, Our Way um, um, guidelines that have been developed up with um, Nalsma, um, CSIRO and, and the IUCN and recommend people to that's available for download as well. So finally, I'd just like to really thank Marley for a fantastic presentation um, towards the end of, you know, towards the end of the day and, and the end of the conference. <laughs> and I think it's been, uh, you know, uh, fantastic to, to hear from you about the work that's happening um, in the Kimberley. And I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what happens into the future with Eye on the Water and so many other um, projects. So thanks again. Again, um, Marley and also um, Janet, and thanks everyone for, for signing on. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.